Hi, uh, my name is Rafael Navarro. I uh, write and draw an independent comic book called Sonambulo. I've been doing it for a few years now, and I try to find some time throughout the year, uh, as busy as it may be, to do another one. Always and forever. So how did you get started in comics? I got started in comics out of just uh, the love of, of the art and the craft. I mean, I've loved comics since I was a kid. If it wasn't for comics, I probably would have never really had any interest in reading. And for that matter, I probably would have never really uh, learned my common sense of good versus evil, you know, because I definitely learned it from any other place. I didn't learn it at church, didn't learn it from my family. I learned it from Stanley and Jack Kirby, mostly. But all kidding aside, no, uh, comics has been one of my favorite mediums of all time in storytelling. It, it, it is a, it's, it's an old friend. It's, it's, it's my first love. And tell, tell me about uh, when you started getting work. Um, I, um, like everyone in this field, I made a little portfolio and I was very humble. Actually, no, I take that back. I was very, very cocky and arrogant in my early years. And I thought I could just go in there and say Marvel Comics slash DC Comics was big two at the time. Um, here I am. You know, take me while, I, while you can. And uh, three years later, and a couple of false starts, I did finally get my first freelance assignment. But it wasn't that easy. It was, it was, it was a struggle. But um, and it's a struggle to even maintain yourself in that field too. If you have the abilities to to uh, to uh, to do the job, that's one thing. But uh, a little luck doesn't hurt either. And consistency in that luck is always something that you should always try to fine in some form or some way because as, as quickly as and as current as you are with the work that you are doing that is amazingly so amazing um, you can fall out of uh, out of touch you know out of the radar as fast as, as you know by not taking an assignment for the next six nine months or so at least that's the way the industry worked you know back you know a hundred thousand years ago so did, did you have did you have a specific experience like this where you, you kind of got in and got back out or well um it, it's just uh in comics, I began to, to learn the real, true life of what the freelancer is. If, if you don't have a gig lined up after this particular assignment is done, yeah, you could spend a great deal of time, if not a vast amount of time, twiddling your thumbs, hoping for your phone for, for your phone to ring. You have to always, you know, as a freelancer, the life of the freelancer always in front, whether it be comics, animation, or or just you know, writing for Rolling Stone magazine. You know, you, while you're working on the assignment, you have to plan ahead. You have to plan a study. You know, okay, this project is going to take me a certain amount of time. I'm going to have all this other time to just, you know, be sitting on my thumbs. I'm going to try to keep, you know, something, you know, aligned. Just when I finish this one project, I can start the next one, and I won't go hungry. So, how much work did you do for Marvel and DC? Uh, not as much as I wanted to at the time, but but enough to definitely learn what the craft was about. I did a, a small handful of assignments at Marvel and, and like two, three projects at DC, and then I uh, then I then I had to grow very very realistic, you know. Um, um, perspective of things and I, I, I knew I had to get something uh, more permanent because I had a mortgage payment, I, just, I had just gotten married at the time and I needed something very stable. So I, uh, I chose animation. I took a pencil test um, and I broke into the field um, pretty much instantly, not, not long afterwards. I still kept my contacts and ties with comics because like I said earlier, it, it, it was and it still is my first love. Um, but uh, I, I, I always had that wandering eye, always going back to comics. And then when it came down to doing comics again, I chose to, uh, to do freelance. Uh, sorry, to do, uh, well, I do freelance for money, but I would also uh, um, want to tell a story from my perspective, something that I would actually really care about, it's just instead of being a hired gun fuel. So you, you got into uh, cartooning pretty early in your career. Yeah, pretty, pretty much so. I think I worked steadily in comics for almost three, four years or so, almost five, yeah. And uh, and I I realized I needed some kind of a steady income. And I thought, well, you know, you know, all the studios I'm working at all are in New York, and I'm in California. I should like look what's going on here locally. And it, it never occurred to me animation would probably be like my best bet. You know, I. I uh, as a comic book artist, as penciler slash inker, uh, and storyteller, uh, um, storyboards are practically not that far from the spectrum of, of that of that kind of style. You're, you're telling stories within the, the camera frame, if you will. You know, uh, you you just have to adjust and adapt to the. Uh, to, 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 the, to the film language of things, you know how, how the camera moves, how it how it uh, tells stories, the pacing, and everything. But essentially, it's the same thing. You know, they're they're just isolated moments in time that you are interpreting for for the viewer. So, how, uh, tell us some of the uh, 
cartoons you've worked for? Um, I've uh, first assignment I ever worked on was on the Rugrats. <laughs> I did that for, for a couple of seasons. I think it was like two and a half seasons or so. Um, left there and worked in various places. Uh, most of the places I worked at, and probably is my most regular stays like Warner Brothers. Uh, there I worked on the Batman, uh, Scooby Doo, Sun Justice League. Uh, handful of projects here and there, uh, Kung Fu, I'm sorry, uh, Shaolin Showdown, and uh, I, at the moment I can't remember, I did mention Scooby-Doo, right? Yes. And, uh, but uh, yeah, the things I'm noted for mostly are the, the Long John stuff, a lot of superheroes, and, and anybody with capes and, and, and boots and, and spit curls on their hair are usually my department. So name some more. Oh gosh. And you, haven't like, you haven't named your current one. Oh, current one. Um, at, actually, at the moment, I'm, I'm looking for a current one. I, I just I applied for two projects, but I, which I'm not uh, um, uh, at liberty to, to name. But uh, but uh, uh, one is for Disney, and, and, and it's about the future in some cyberspace world. <laughs> And, and another one is, is uh, um, four amphibians, you know, that say whoa and cowabunga. Uh, but I, I'll see who answers the call to those two projects next week. So yeah, I'm not kidding. I just applied for them this past cool. week or so. so. And what have you been working on? Uh, I worked on, most recently, I worked on this project, which I really had lots of fun with. It's, uh, it's, it's called um, um, Hero Factory. It's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's like a, it's from the creators of uh, Lego's, uh, um, oh god, um, Bionicles, and it's just basically robots who are not in disguise, but they beat the crap out of each other for like 30 minutes, and very curvy ass, you should appreciate that, you know, big giant metallic hands smacking each other, big jug juggernaut monster type, of, you know, mechanical, you know, creatures with personalities, and I had lots of fun with it, it was just, it was, you know, lots of, I haven't had this much fun since probably like, since, since Stripperella, I think. <laughs> oh, there's another project I worked on too. Okay. And I was thinking of the Superhero Squad. Oh, and um, oh, Superhero Squad. Yeah. There's my short-term memory. Yeah. That was lots of fun. It was. It was just. Um, it was weird because at first it was like I was so looking forward to you know realistic superheroes and the Avengers actually, for the, which were where my heart's content was when I first applied for uh, for the project there at Marvel. Um, Super Squad was offered to me while I was waiting for that particular project, which never came to be. But I had a ball working on this Marvel, this Marvel Super Squad because I um, one of the things I made made it really happy. I'm not sure if you guys know the show, but it's it's um, it's basically uh, um, the toy line popular toy line that was happening in the last two, three years at Marvel, these little squish, you know, super, super mini deformed versions of all the Marvel characters, but in the classic Silver Age, right? Um, that's all fine and dandy, but what made the show become very, very embraceable to me is like, instead of just consider it was just a, another mere annoying toy line you know, being done as an anima animated show, I thought it more as the... Uh, the, the, the traditional classic Marvel 60s Irving Forbush, you know, uh, yeah, the Brand X comic put to an animated cartoon feature. Yeah, once I started thinking thinking of it in those terms, uh, of the Marvel Super Squad was, it was like Mad Magazine for, for the Silver Age. It was, it was fantastic. I had a ball doing it. It was, it was, it was, it was tremendous. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about uh, when and why and how you chose to uh, start self-publishing The ardent desire to always tell a story. If it isn't on, in, in, in napkin papers at a bar with your friend, or, or telling stories to your nieces and nephews about, the, about, about the, the, when you worked at the circus when you were four years old as a trapeze artist, which never really was true, um, you just find the time. Um, I loved comics. I was already working in animation. I was comfortable. I was I was very very happy. And then then the creative monster genius within you always haunts you. You know, gnaws at your mind, saying, "No, you need to tell something within your, within your own you know fiber, within your own person. You, you you need to tell a personal story." That's how self publishing came to be. I, I never approached it with the intention of becoming a millionaire. I, I've had a nominee for several awards. I had a very, very good time throughout the years. I met wonderful, fantastic people along the way. Um, and it's put me in, in, in lights unheard of. Um, I, I've notoriety in a particular style or genre called the, the, the Lucha Noir mass Mexican wrestler genre, which I never knew I even had a part of creating such a thing. Um, and it's all been fine and dandy, but one of the greatest things was just the satisfaction of telling a story. Um, if, if there was any monetary compensation along the way, it was just more, um, 
more, more, more icing on the cake. Another cherry for my, uh, for my Sunday. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about some of the awards you won. Um, I one of the first awards I, I won was the Zurich Award, which was a very prestigious award. I I, uh, I I just thought it was just a fluke to try to apply for that because at the time they were. They were um, giving out awards to uh, mostly just slice of life stories, things that had a more provocative personal feel. Where I was doing a comic book about a mass Mexican wrestler detective, you know, with a the penchant for, for trouble and, and blondes, and, and, and actually the blondes that could be the trouble at the same time. Troubling blondes, uh, or, or the trouble with blondes. <laughs> But um, I was doing a, a, an action adventure thing, you know, almost you know, escape this fantasy, if you will. I, I, I thought I had no chance in winning the award because I, 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 I thought I had nothing, you know, aesthetic to offer. But magically, I got it. I was very, very grateful and very, very honored. Well, what is the Zurich Grand? The Zurich Grand, it's, it's an award that's given on a yearly basis, and it's. Um, I think it's 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 given it's given out to, to a number of comics. I don't know exactly how many, but they have uh, they have two um, two opportunities to do it throughout the year. I think one is in I think in the, in the fall. The other one is like in the spring. And um, it's founded by uh, one of the one of the uh, the, the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle uh, creators. Uh, 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 here. No, sorry. Is it Kevin? Well, I, I, I do digress. It's one of the one of the two. The one that's not living in California. Basically. I think it's Peter Laird. Uh, Peter's uh, the one, one of the, uh, the, the spokespersons of the Zirk Award, and every year, um, like I said, they, they give out awards, which is more like a like a grant, if you will. It's like money. It's not just a prestigious award like the Eisner Award, you know, like in our field that we know and everything. It, 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 it also comes with money, and it, the, I think that's the advantage. I think the key is for them, the creating such an award, was to, to give it to those who are, are, are in, in, uh, I guess, in, in, in a great need financially as well as, you know, deserving of, of having some kind of a project that, that's out there. And I, like I said, I, I was very, very honored to, to be given such an award at the time. And I, 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 it's, it's a wonderful feather to wear to this day. It's safe to say that my comic book was built on the backs of turtles, man. <laughs> Did, did it win any other awards or? Uh, no, it was, it was, I know it was nominated for other pro, other other things. I think it was like an Ignace, and, and, and another it might have been an Eisner. I don't know. It's, I, I'm I'm old now, so I, I don't remember much of these things. To begin with. I just know what it's been, um, what's where where it's gotten. Um, it's been optional to film several times in, in, in recent years, and the most recent one right now is Sergio Aguero and uh, and uh, oh god, I see that, but the Three Monkeys Productions. They're they're the ones that did uh, the Mama Tambien. Motorcycle Diaries and working on it. And uh, it's a, a Spanish producer uh, from Spain, and uh, uh, he's, he's a sweet, wonderful man, and he, he knows the vision of the book, and recognizes it, respects it, and I, I'm in full confidence of what he'll do with it. So you said it's been optioned several times. Tell several me about times. that process. Oh, how, how did uh, these people approach you? Um, well, every, every other convention or so, usually a major uh, convention, I'm always approached by some producer or a production company that's interested in, in picking up the project. Sometimes um, they even offer a, 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 a hefty sum. I don't know sure if it's hefty, but it's some kind of a sum to, to uh, ask permission that they can say that they are, um, you know, I guess, uh, um, showing the project to, to them that they are caved they are recording you you know through Hollywood to get you to, uh, to, to, to to sign your book off you know when the deal comes and everything and once that option uh, time runs out um, they give you your money and you know they, they sorry it didn't work out and they, they, they move on to that project I know a lot of creative people that are making a lot of money getting their, their projects option on a, on a daily basis and once the thing once the option runs out they, they, they have another person offering you money all Again. It's kind of cool. It's like a little extra incentive, you know, when, when the book's not selling so well, you know, throughout the year. <laughs> um, so you uh, you created this comic when? Oh, um, I created Sonambulo in uh, gosh, I, uh, realistically, I think I created him around '93, '94 in my sketchbooks, playing out with the idea. He didn't see the light of day on paper until about maybe 90, late 95, going on early 6, I, uh, 96. I, uh, I gave him as an ash can, uh, preview edition, I think, at the time I was calling it. But I think at the time, the, 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 the tradition was, was, was you put out an ash can first, see how the market does for it, or you create a market. 
and uh, and you take it from there. Uh, I I debuted him at the uh, the Eight Con of '95. Yeah. Okay. And uh, how many books have come out? Uh, um, I try to average one book a year. Um, some some years I did one or two. So uh, and I've been publishing for about 14, 15 years. I guess it's about the amount of books I, I've done, maybe about 14, 15 or so. And I've done a collection. I'm sure that counts as an extra book. But, but I always say if you ever go to press and you go through the pain and heartache of have, having to self-publish and go to press, I think that counts as a, as a book as well, too, even though it's a reprint. <laughs> What I could tell you, though, um, um, this industry and what it does, um, um, you have to be prepared for what it does to you, both both, both, uh, both professionally and privately, personally. I've known people and I've known uh, 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 friends that, that have struggled throughout the whole thing, and it's cost them um, not just financial hardships, but emotional hardships. It even costs people's marriages, for that matter. It's just, you have to be prepared to, um, to take a lot of losses, you know, with your gains, of course. You have to be serious. You have to um, um, approach it like a business, but at the same time, it's like a it's like a samurai code where you know you if you assume you're not going to get anything out of it, you'll be you'll be fine. You know, when anything positive comes out of it, and you know this as a, as a publisher yourself, a self publisher, it is, it is a struggle. It is, it is it is hard. You know, um, in the end, you know. It's, it's probably you and yourself only that probably cares for your monster that you created. Like, although, although I did for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, are, are there any other struggles you might care to share besides, uh, like, uh, getting your books printed or, you know, anything you can think of? Everything is, you know, without question, whether it be a small business, you're, you're going to open up, you know, a, a, some small store for left-handed people and, and, you know, tools and whatnot. To, to self-publishing a book, I mean, you will always, I mean, just be prepared for just financial hardships, hard, hardships no matter what. It's just, it's, it's just a, it's just a given, okay? Um, I guess one of the, one of the main things that for me, it's more, um, it's more your own personal demons, okay? It's trying to find the time to get your project done while you're trying to maintain a full-time job or, or, or personal life as well. I mean, uh, those are the things that will definitely challenge you. You know, if you really, really believe in your project, one or the other is going to suffer. Try, I guess the key is to always try to find a balance of both things, you know? You know, find the time to spend time with the people you care and love about, but at the same time, this is the monster that requires, you know, your, your being, you know, ah, oh, it's groaning at you, it's, it's gnawing at you, saying, I, I want to be alive, and it can't live without you breathing life into it. So therefore, you try to make the time to get the project done before a, a big major convention. Thus, this other thing, your personal life begins to suffer because of it. You have to find a balance, you know. I mean, it's easier said than done, and, uh, and it's a struggle, I guess, for me, always, always and forever.